Hey guys, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. I'm the founder of the Austin Center for Developing Minds. Uh, we are located just north of Austin, Texas in Cedar Park. And what we do is we focus on developmental functional neurology. Hopefully you'll have a chance to catch my lecture because I'm going to be taking you through what that process looks like and why it's so important to focus on rehabbing the brain in the right way uh, at the right time with the right frequency and oscillations and all this kind of stuff, right? So I'm very honored to be a part of this conference. Uh, this conference is very meaningful. I love all the people involved and obviously the cause is fantastic. So thank you again and I look forward to seeing you soon. Hey everyone, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. So I am co-founder of the company Shed Light. Shed Light is a company that focuses on the use of laser and light therapy to improve the health and wellness of the brain and body. Um, we're happy and excited to be a part of this uh, conference. And so, you know, if you have any more questions or want any information regarding how laser and light therapy can improve your health, please check us out. Go to uh, shedlightcoldlasers.com. Thanks. So I'm Lindsay Asawa and I am a licensed psychologist. I have a clinic in Missouri City called Missouri City Family Counseling. Um, we have seven of us. We have five licensed therapists and two psychologists and do lots of testing and evaluations as well as therapy for all ages. And so um, I'm Allison and I joined up to do this because this is a topic that we both feel is really important and we both see it in our practices um, quite often and have lots of questions about this. And so I'm going to talk about this more from a psychologist's perspective or a therapist's perspective. So some kind of some larger issues that as parents um, or as professionals that you might want to be thinking about when you're working on transitioning teens special needs teens in particular to adulthood. And then Allison's gonna be talking about some more practical um, tips and ideas as well. And so I'm gonna get started and go through a few things. Okay, let's see. All right, so the first thing that I wanted to mention, um, which I think is actually kind of the most important from what I see in our clinic when we're working with families is understanding um, your child's diagnosis. So we're talking here about kids and teens who are not neurotypical. So these are neurodiverse children and teens who have brains that are, are not your typically developing or typically um, wired brain. And so when we're thinking about that, and when you receive a diagnosis um, or a description of your child's challenges, the most important thing is to really start from understanding it. So making sure that you do your research, that you ask questions, um, and but you get a full perspective of both the challenges and the strengths that come along with that diagnosis, um, because that then will help you to set up some more realistic expectations of what, um, what your child may need and uh, where their path may lead them and how you can help them. Um, one issue that we see so often with parents is, is that struggle to, um, to let go of their expectations that they had, maybe going into having children, they may have a very specific idea of what that path may be for their child. And so I really encourage you to keep an open mind um, and even consider a non-traditional path for your child as they're transitioning out of your care. So really think about all of the options and be open to those options because their path may not look the same as their friends or um, family, other family members. Um, some of those examples of things to think about, things like driver's license, you may want to consider delaying their driver's license. Um, and, you know, we see that, for example, with teens who have ADHD and may struggle with impulsivity and attention issues. Um, and maybe they are not developmentally ready exactly at 16 to get their driver's license, and that is okay. It's okay to push it back. Um, Trade school, considering things like trade school, community college, other options for their education, and not necessarily kind of a traditional four-year university path, um, or maybe even considering those things as stepping stones along the way to that four-year university. So keeping those educational options open. Um, if your child does go on to um, a higher level 
education. Then another thing to think about is a reduced course load. So that's another, another non-traditional option that you can have is to reduce their course load, at least initially, to kind of help ease them into it, um, rather than expecting them to start off right off the bat with that full course load. Um, another thing to think about is living at home versus living on campus. So a lot of our, our special needs or neurodiverse teens that we work with um, may not be ready when they're 18 to move out and live on their own. And that is okay. And so that's another thing to really think about is, you know, would it be best for them and their development to maybe live at home a little bit longer, make sure that you're working on some skills and really preparing them before they um, consider living on campus or on their own. So I think the bottom point is kind of the most important is no comparison. So especially parents out there who are listening to this, it is so important to try your hardest and stop comparing. We hear that all the time, you know, parents that are comparing their child to their, their other children or to their nieces and nephews or the other kids in their class. And it's just not helpful for you as a parent um, in getting your mind in the right place. And it's certainly not helpful for your child when that spills over to them. And one of the things that we struggle with the most as psychologists and therapists in working with kids who are wired differently is that over time it chips away at their self-esteem and they really start to struggle with self-esteem. So we see um, young adults coming in who are really at a, a low point and that's when we have a risk for depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms. Um, so I really would encourage you to look at your child as an individual um, and really try to understand them and try not to compare them with others because their path just may look different and their needs are going to be different. So, okay, moving on. So this scaffolding is an idea that I think can be really, really important for parents of kids who um, are wired differently. So what you need, what scaffolding means is to meet a child where they are, kind of assess where they are, and build upon that foundation. So start where they are and then move at their pace. So um, rather than maybe the traditional pace or the pace that you are expecting of them, go at their pace. And one way that can help with this is to really figure out where they are to begin with. And so you may need to do some assessing to figure that out. And this may need to happen multiple times over the course of their childhood or their young adult, adulthood. Um, something that I have found is really helpful, there's a website called livesinthebalance.org. I have that listed at the bottom. And um, this is developed by a psychologist named Ross Green, and he has lots of helpful information on that website for parents. Um, but one thing that he's developed is this assessment, and you'll see over on the right of the slide, and you can download this from the website, that he developed this assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. And so it's a good way for you to actually go through the checklist and really think about what skills are lagging, what skills are behind, and be specific of, with examples of, you know, in what way are those skills behind, and what are some of the unsolved problems at this point in their development. And you can start from there, and, and then it will give you a basis for a plan of where to go and how to help them and what they need to practice and improve. Um, another really important point is to, Balance the, the importance of encouraging independence with also providing that safety net. So I see parents struggle all the time with this balance of how much help do I give my, my teen and how much do I back off and, um, and let them do it themselves. And it is a really difficult balance. And I see parents kind of going to both extremes. Um, and so there, I think that the best way to do that is to think about along the way, you're gonna to want to constantly encourage independence. If there's things that you know they are capable of doing, then it's okay to push them a little bit and say, I know you can do this, you're gonna do it this time without me. But that also doesn't mean abandoning them. And I also see parents taking that extreme approach that because you are 17, you're 18 now, um, it's your life, it's your decision, you're on your own. And I think that can also be really difficult and damaging at times when, when our teens are just not ready. And so I think that if you can still be there as a backup, as a safety net, but you're pushing them and you're encouraging them to try things on their own, um, I think that can be kind of a really, really helpful approach. And 
like I said, it's going to depend a lot on those lagging skills. So there's going to be some skills that are much farther behind. And those are, those are the skills that you are not going to then throw them out there on their own. They're still going to need, be needing your help along the way. But there's skills that they may be um, doing well with. And those might be things that you can go ahead and allow them some independence. I put the point on here, practice, 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 because kids who, whose brains are wired differently, um, what tends to happen is that they have difficulty with skills that other, other kids may find much easier. And the, those kinds of skills may not come naturally to them. And so the best way to create new paths in the brain would be to practice, just to do those behaviors over and over and over again. And it starts to actually rewire the brain. There are studies showing this evidence that we can rewire the brain. Um, and I think that's really important because if you teach your child some new skills and kind of send them out there to do it, it's not gonna take one time. They're not gonna have it overnight. You have to go through the motions again and again and again and make it part of their routine. Um, and that is what's gonna help to build those new pathways in the brain and to prepare them um, to, to be more independent. So the last point on here is that you're not doing this alone and keep that in mind. So along the way, it is absolutely okay to reach out for the help of therapists, coaches, tutors, um, but start with this list of their lagging skills and figure out which of those do you need extra support and help with and, and helping them to build those skills. And then bring in the help. So find tutors, find coaches and therapists for them. And I think this is also an important point as they are reaching that point of, of moving out on their own and becoming more independent. That is the time when you really are pulling back a little bit from them. And what may help and what may provide that a little bit of a safety net is to get them connected with a coach or a therapist or a tutor, someone that is not you, but someone that they can check in with regularly, that can hold them accountable. Um, and this might be especially if they are going to be at some distance from you, so moving to another city, then it will be really important to make sure that there's someone there, a support person there that they can check in with. And that's something that's helped so much in transitioning many of our teens um, to more independent lifestyles. So another point that I wanted to make is the idea of advocating for themselves. I want the teens that we work with to learn how to speak up for themselves and learn how to self-advocate. So this, there's a few steps involved in this. The first step, in, before you can advocate for yourself, you have to understand yourself, right? So teaching them self-awareness along the way is extremely helpful. And this should start as early as elementary school, but absolutely by middle school, as parents and as professionals, we need to be working with them to help them understand themselves better. So I put some, a helpful little worksheet on here, and this is something else you can download from a website called understood.org. It's a very helpful website with lots of good information and articles. Um, but this, this particular worksheet, it's a self-awareness worksheet, and it just gives you a guideline to go through with your child and ask them some questions. So what are three of your greatest strengths? What two things seem harder for you than for other kids your age? What are two of your favorite things to do, two of your least favorite things to do? You kind of walk through it with them, and it gives you, it gives you and it gives them a chance to really self-reflect and figure out what are their strengths and weaknesses and what do they need to be successful. Um, so once they have kind of developed that self-awareness, then the next step is to really help them learn about the resources that are available to them and learn how to reach out for those resources. And you can model that. Parents can model that for their kids. So don't leave them out of that process. When you are looking into um, academic tutors, for example, bring your child into that, particularly if they're in middle school or high school, um, have them be part of that. So look, research it together, look at different tutor options together, get their input, ask them questions um, so that they can understand what that process looks like and they can learn that there are resources out there for them. A lot of parents tend to take on this job for their kids and then when their kids get to that point of independence, they really have no idea how to do that or what even exists out there for them. Um, so another part of it would be including them in their, um, their accommodations meetings. So 504 accommodations and, and IEP um, or ARD meetings through public 
it's really, really important for um, teens to be involved in those meetings. So beginning in middle school, but absolutely by high school, they should be involved in those meetings so that they can speak up for themselves. And you can encourage that, parents can encourage that by getting ready and preparing beforehand. So sit down with them and talk to them about what accommodations do you feel would be helpful or not, and maybe help them make a list. I think we're having a little they want to bring up in the meeting so that they feel confident and prepared. A lot of people, what was that? Sorry. I think we're having a little technical difficulty. You froze there for a minute. So I'm, I'm no. not that part, but we're hearing you now. So perfect. Okay. Okay. So I had made it to that last point. If you need me to back up, let me know, Allison. Um, but I was mentioning that um, I think it's also really important and really difficult actually for a lot of kids to understand how to explain themselves to others. And this is an important step in, in helping them to transition because we need to help them to know what to say when they are with their peers or with their teachers um, or employers. They need to know, they need to have the words to explain themselves, maybe to explain their diagnosis or without using the label, just to explain what are their challenges and what do they need. Um, and so it's something that you can actually role play and practice at home and get them comfortable with it and give them some words to use. Okay. Um, yeah. One thing um, that we, we did that I think um, was definitely helpful in this when, when it came to advocacy, um, obviously, if we have special need kids, you know, we've spent a lot of time in doctor's office. Now, clearly, some are ASD and maybe nonverbal, so we have those challenges, right? right. Going to these mini doctor's appointments, especially starting junior high, high school, um, you're going to see a new specialist, letting your child communicate this is who I am, and then you can fill in the gaps. Like, so like we would practice in the car, you know, when the doctor walks in, he's going to ask you, you know, some things like, um, you know, can you, let's tell, let's pretend he's never met you before. What is your history? Let's talk about this. Like, what are some very important things that he needs to know instead of me, like being the mouse in the pocket, you know, that, you know, we're, we're going to say everything. So that was helpful because there, we're not always going to all these doctor's appointments forever and we've done it forever so it's like second nature for us but that that was something that was definitely very helpful and we had a lot of practice with that so I, I think that that is definitely um, a, a, I, I think it's important but I think also um, the involvement having the involvement and like picking um, you know, are feeling like that they have a say in some of this, like when we're like it, it interviewing tu tutors or some of those things that you were talking about and kind of meeting the child where they are is picking the right tutor, right? You know, there, there might be that right tutor that is just a really, really good fit for the child. And another one might be a great tutor, but isn't a good fit. So yeah. I think that is so good. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, those are great examples. And, and that's why the self-awareness piece is so, so important. And that's not something that happens quickly. So I really encourage you, however old your children are, to start right away if you haven't done a lot of this and really work with them on understanding themselves a little bit better. And um, I think that's, that's kind of the basis of, of teaching them how to self-advocate. So, okay, moving on to finding a good fit. This is something that we honestly talk with parents about almost daily um, because it's so extremely important. I love this quote, and I've used this before. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So I see so many parents that are kind of pushing and shoving um, their kids to fit a mold that we expect or that our society expects, and it can cause so much emotional damage over the years. And so what's really a better approach and a healthier approach is to look for a good fit. So once you really have a good understanding of your child and what they need, what their strengths and weaknesses are, then along the way, you can really put some thought into what is a good fit for them with regards to schools, um, maybe public versus private schools, um, colleges, like I said before, versus 
trade schools and community colleges, but really think about what is a good fit for them. Would they do better in a larger or smaller environment? Do they do better with face-to-face -face or, or virtual? You know, think about all of these things and think about how it fits with your child. Um, even things like extracurricular activities. I've seen kids really struggle because maybe the program that they're in just wasn't really designed for kids with, with their needs. Um, and so really think about the instructor, the coach, um, are they a good fit for your child and what they need? Is the program a good fit? Is the summer camp a good fit for your child? Um, and then thinking towards the future, helping them think also about their career path and what might be a good fit for them um, and the setting that they are going to be working in because these things are going to really help to predict their ultimate success. And I, a, an example that I had, a client that I worked with is, uh, was in her 30s, a woman in her 30s had already held at least 15 jobs um, and all of them for a short period of time and she was really struggling to kind of figure out why this was a problem for her and this is a woman with pretty severe ADHD symptoms and one thing that we figured out as we kind of went through and talked about these these different positions she had held was that she always seemed to do better in positions where she was up and moving around and interacting with people and she had more trouble with jobs where she had to be sitting at a desk, looking at a screen, um, reading. And so, I mean, those are important points. And once she kind of figured out those, those, um, those points, then I think she was able to really think more about what kind of job would be a better fit for her so that she could be successful for longer and stay at that, at that um, employer longer. So the last point that I wanted to make before I pass it over to Allison is, a little bit more information about accommodations. I mentioned accommodations earlier. Um, many of you may already be familiar with the idea of academic accommodations or workplace accommodations, um, but a quick few points that I wanted to mention were, first of all, these are, um, these are things that your child, because they have, because their brain is wired differently and they may have a diagnosis or a special need, um, they are, they have the right to receive accommodations by law, both in school and in work. Um, for school, it's particularly in government funded schools. And I really encourage you to educate yourself about these accommodations. I have a lot of parents ask whether this is something that enables their child. That's a really big question that people have and a concern that they have. And my argument after working with so many teens and young adults over the years is that um, what accommodations do is that they level the playing ground. You know, they're already set up for failure in some ways because the schools, many schools and workplaces are not designed for the neurodiverse brain. You know, they're designed for the neurotypical brain. And so we're sending our kids into these schools and these workplaces um, really already set up for failure. And so we're putting them at risk. And I think that it's really important that we set them up for success because of what I said earlier about how important self-esteem is. Maintaining their self-esteem is so important to their future success and their future happiness. So in order to set them up for success, we need to level that playing ground and make it a fair, fair playing ground. So accommodations in school can do that for them. And um, keep in mind that beyond elementary, middle, and high school, they can also seek accommodations at higher levels of education. So on the SAT and ACT, so the college board exams, they can request accommodations on those, on AP exams in high school. Um, and then at community colleges and colleges, four-year universities, they all offer um, accommodations through their disability department. And even on graduate level exams. So we've had um, students that were taking the MCATs, the LSATs, um, the GREs, all of these exams and all of these higher level courses, your student may qualify for accommodations. But the important thing is to check requirements early. So really start, start now, start looking into this now and really educate yourself about it um, so that you know when and what you are going to need. Um, also, one thing to think about now is what accommodations are necessary for them and why. Because when you're filling out those applications to request accommodations, you're going to need to know what to request and be able to explain why. Um, and you can look up on all of these different um, sources. So on the College Board website, um, you can look up, depending on the individual community college, 
Temple University, any of them, you can look up information about what accommodations they offer and what the requirements are to apply for those accommodations. Um, so start looking up that information. Another important point I wanna make because I do a lot of the testing that is required for these accommodations is in order to request accommodations, you do have to have some support for that. As a parent, you can't just say that my child needs this. You have to have a professional that, that did some testing to be able to determine if that's true. And so even if your child has been tested at a younger and earlier age, um, keep in mind that a lot of these programs require testing to be updated. And it's usually anywhere from between three and five years. Um, that's how recent the testing needs to be. So keep that in mind when you're kind of thinking ahead. So if your child's in middle school, um, think ahead that, and consider testing when they are um, beginning high school. But make sure that you've done it with enough time to be able to prepare and apply for those accommodations when you need to. And then as far as the workplace accommodations go, a lot of families are not even aware that this is um, an option. And I also hear a lot of parents saying, well, when, when he or she goes out into the real world, they're not gonna be able to have accommodations. So why should we do that now? But I just want you to know that it is a possibility. It is an option. Um, and under the law, it's reasonable accommodation is required in workplaces if it does not pose hardship on the employer. So that's, that's the kind of vague area um, that can be tricky to determine and employers, um, employers have different ways of interpreting that. But I would encourage you to visit these two websites. So the Department of Labor website and Job Accommodation Network, they both have really, really good information, even listed by diagnosis, as far as what accommodations you can ask for in the workplace and how to go through that process. They kind of spell out the process for you of who to contact, um, how to do it, whether it needs to be in writing or not. Um, and so these are things to look into now and educate yourself on, make sure you're aware of them so that you can be prepared um, in the future. Lindsay, um, really great information. And um, a couple of things on this. Um, we really went through this um, with one of my own um, children. And um, if you're thinking about higher education for your child, again, um, Lindsay said it a couple of times, start early, you know, you're, start this process early. Um, dealing with the college board um, is frustrating. It's slow. However, I will say I had a, a interaction with them um, this summer during the pandemic and they turned it around in a week. It's never happened. It's usually six or eight weeks, just so you know. Um, but what I was going to say is um, all these colleges, um, uh, community colleges, universities, uh, they have an office of disability. So when we're exploring colleges with these kids, one of my first priorities, um, well, first, I already had a list of the accommodations that I knew we needed, right? And so then one of the first places we went to is and met with was the Office of Disability. Because what I will tell you is that all offices of disability are not created equally. Some are much better than others. And so it was important for me, for my daughter to land at a school that had a great Office of Disability. So I was actually interviewing them. I wanted to know what they had. Did they have audiobooks? Did they have Bookshare, Learning LA? What, platform did they have um, so so take your time and learn about that um, there there are definitely some that are um, better than others and then another thing that i wanted to bring up as far as the workplace accommodations um, as parents we've got to share this with our, our our young folks they don't know this i mean they've hardly even had a job if they've had a job so they don't know these types of things um, but there is um, something called the greater houston disability chamber um, of commerce and that was formed about three or four years ago. It was one of the first um, chambers for, for individuals with disabilities formed in the United States. So, um, so Houston was kind of, um, kind of first on that. But they really work with employers that focus and work with people that have disabilities. They know the employers that are good to work with. And so that may be something, I think it's very cheap to join. Um, the, the, I don't even know that you have to join. But there's a lot of resources on that page that you might want to um, take a look at as well. But, but definitely start early and these, you know, these accommodations matter. Now, one, one thing to think about too, 
Um, you know, a lot of our kids, I mean, we do have, you know, kids that have special needs that are also gifted and talented. Um, a lot of our kids may not test well. So that may be like a, a source of um, angst of the whole idea of taking the SAT or the ACT. They don't have to. So, you know, if they're going to enter in through a path of the community college, you can avoid that entire stress, you know, because they don't have to take the SAT or the ACT if they're going to go to the community college first. And, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our kids, um, you know, kind of start that path because they're a little bit slower uh, to mature. So it's just something to think about. Society tells us that all of our children have to take the ACT and the SAT, but it's not necessarily true. So you can kind of wiggle with that. In an earlier slide that you had, um, Lindsay, you talked about driving, about maybe delaying driving and things like that. And I just wanted to mention um, for the families that may have not heard, uh, there are two driving schools. There's Stromat Driving School and there's Miller Driving School. And these two driving schools are, are focused on um, independence and helping people with disabilities drive, right? They do, um, thorough assessments. They have computer-based assessments and obviously behind the wheel assessments. But if you have a child that's, um, you know, ASD or ADHD or kind of, uh, maybe they have a physical disability, you want to make sure that their reaction time is fast enough to be behind the wheel. Um, I strongly recommend reaching out to one of those um, companies as opposed to your normal run-of-the-mill um, driver's ed. Um, programs because they can really properly assess to make sure that your child um, is safe. And if they're not safe initially, they can help get them there. It, it, it's kind of about um, some independence. So I've got a few questions, Lindsay. I'm gonna, um, I'm going to take a look here. Um, are employers required to implement accommodations? Hold on, they're coming in faster than I can read them. Hang on one second. So, hmm. bear with me. The name of the chamber is the Greater Houston Disability Chamber. Um, that was the name of the chamber. Okay. Are all employers required to implement accommodations if no undue hardship is posted? So, it, I mean, again, this is something that I think can be tricky because it's something that may you may need to make a case with the employer. And there ha I have had clients who have had to go um, above the employer to the Department of Labor, you know, and dispute some of those situations. And so I think it's just, I really honestly encourage you to visit these websites um, because I think you'll find a lot of the answers to those kinds of questions on the website. Allison, do you have anything to add to that from your experience? Um, I would say that would go back to the Department of Labor. I probably don't get in the weeds with that. I mean, I would say that I've, I mean, I've definitely heard of employers. Some employers are um, better than others as far as implementing them. Like HEB, for instance, is pretty good, right? Um, so that's one that, you know, you hear on a pretty regular basis that they're, they're, they're pretty good, good at that. Um, I have heard of others where they weren't good. Right, you know, where they gave a hard a hard time, and and the individual was so frustrated that they quit, and they had a financial hardship as a result of that. So, I think it's all, you know, I think it's all across the board. But this is where that advocacy thing comes in. So, whether you're a mom and you're teaching your child to advocate for themselves, um, what I do know for sure is there are a ton of resources in the greater Houston area. You know, we live in the fourth largest metropolitan area in the United States. There are a lot of great resources for special needs. We might not always be doing the greatest job. We might be in last place in the public schools for special needs. I mean, there's some things that we, we don't do well, but there are a lot of organizations out there. There are a lot of agencies. There is a lot of help um, in this area. And so, and, and it's, although it's a, a large community, it's small, we kind of all know each other. So, you know, being able to refer, you know, refer you out to someone else that may be able to help you um, with your specific questions, um, you know, I think that that can definitely happen. And I think, I just want to add, I think this also go, goes back to that idea of the fit as well, finding a good fit. So, um, helping your child to, or your young adult to research the options ahead of time and look for positions where accommodations might be more 
um, doable, you know, and where and look for employers who are going to be more open to that um, so that you'll get less pushback and it'll be a positive experience rather than a negative experience. So really try to find the best fit. So we do have a comment here that says, I'm, you know, I'm reluctant about disclosing my disabilities to a possible employer during an interview because I'm afraid that it could make me an undesir undesirable um, as a job candidate. And I think that, you know, I think it's possible, you know, that is possible. You do want to put your best foot forward. Um, um, you know, and I think honesty comes a long way. I think employers don't like um, where a person has like major, major issues that limit their ability to work at all and they don't disclose any of that. And then the first week that they're hired or the first day that they're on their job, then full disclosure happens. I think employers definitely frown on that. Um, but I, you know, I think kind of a combination of, I mean, you, they can't ask you, they, you know, they can't ask you those questions like what's wrong with you, um, you know, so, you, you know, but I think sometimes employers appreciate honesty, so they're not going to ask you. But if, if you, you know, say, um, I have, you know, I have this and, you know, it, it, it's posed these challenges, but here's how I've overcome them. And I'm so excited or, you know, it's, it's all how you position it. If you, if you um, polish it up and deliver it, if you say, well, you know, I have this disability and it's been horrible and, you know, it's limited my life, but, you know, I mean, of course that's gloom and doom, but, um, but, you know, when you're, when you're a person that really, um, you over or around it through as a survivor, as a thriver, like you rise above and beyond your disability and you're awesome still. Um, people, people like that, like em employers like that. That is, that, that's the type of people that they want on their team. So, so I say don't worry about that. Um, okay, what can you do um, for or with a teenager that doesn't want to acknowledge their disability and refuses services that they really need? Um, where can I get a good assessment on my 18 year old to determine where he's at or um, where to start? Um, do you want to uh, hit on that? Sure, sure. Um, so this is actually a really common problem that a lot of parents face um, because it is hard to share those, those weaknesses or those challenges with others and to admit them or acknowledge them. Um, and we have a lot of kids really push back and fight the, the things that we know would be helpful to them. Um, but that's where working on that self-awareness piece is so important and really trying to balance the strengths and the weaknesses. So as parents, sometimes we may have a tendency un unintentionally to focus a little too much on the weaknesses because we're worried about our kids and we want to push them and we want to help them. Um, but I hear so much of that. And so we need to really balance it with pointing out their strengths as well and really talking about it in a balanced way so that they don't see it as a negative thing. They see it as that's just me. You know, I, we want to teach them to think about it that way that I'm, I have these challenges, and I have these strengths and that's just who I am. And if they can, if we can help them feel that way, then they're more likely to be able to share that, that with others. Um, and as far as the assessment goes, um, so these types of assessments are going to be done by psychologists typically. Um, and there's, there's the idea of doing an evaluation. It's kind of like an investigation. And the psychologist is basically going to do some assessments with your child, um, gather information from you as parents, maybe gather information from teachers as well, and kind of put all those pieces, those puzzle pieces together, to have a good understanding of your child and what they need. So that's the goal of the evaluation and psychologists are trained to do that. Um, and as far as where to go, so if you would like to contact me, I can help to send you in the right direction, whether someone at our clinic or whether another psychologist in the area would be a good fit, depending on what you need, then I can help you with that. And so at the end of this, at the end of the slides, we have our contact information listed and feel free to reach out to me and I can kind of send you in the right direction. And I I'm a believer in, in testing. Like, okay, I think it's important. We need to know where we are. Like if, if we're struggling with anxiety and depression on top of whatever the other, um, you know, disabilities are, you need to know that. And so again, back to that accommodations, this assessment, if you haven't had an assessment in the last three to five years and you hope to get accommodations, for high school, for higher learning, then you need to do this. You need to go that direction. Now, some of the schools will do their assessments. Some of the schools won't, won't um, most schools won't, public schools won't take your outside assessment to, to make 
to, to, to implement. They're going to do their own testing. But I prefer the outside testing because I want to know the whole gamut, not just what they're willing to test because they don't always test everything in the school. So I want to know what my child needs independently of what the school s says they need. So uh, that's my choice. I mean, it's your choice too, um, but I am definitely a fan. Granted, you can get it for free uh, in, in the public school, but it's limited and I'm just I'm definitely a friend, a, a fan of, of of knowing it on my own. It's my my information that I paid for and had it properly assessed. So I, I'm definitely a fan of that. Okay, so we have. Allison, can I just jump in really quick? I need to clarify a couple of quick points about that. So and one thing to let you know, as far as the schools accepting the outside evaluations, many districts will accept outside evaluations. But what it is is that they they may add a piece to it. Um, so what they oftentimes will do is they will take what has been done if they feel like it's been a good thorough evaluation, but it's missing an observation piece, like a classroom observation, and they will add that onto it, and then they will go ahead and set up a plan from there. So it's not necessarily going to be um, rejected by the district. It will be included, and some districts really appreciate it because they're so overloaded and overwhelmed, and they have kids on long wait lists for testing. But another thing to for you to know as parents is if you do get, if your child is evaluated through the district, you disagree or you're not sure about their diagnosis or their findings, then you do have a right to seek an independent educational evaluation. It's called an IEE. And there are providers all over town who are trained and able to provide these evaluations, but it's an outside evaluation that the district pays for. So that's an important thing to know. And you have the right as a parent um, to seek that if you want to, if you disagree or you have any concerns about the school's evaluation. Okay, go on. Sorry, Allison. Yeah, no, no. I was just kind of um, looking more at the, the chat box um, as well. Um, um, can you just give it an, an, over, an overview? Um, just kind of, I know that's a really, it's a broad question and all across the board, um, but we have a question of like about how much does it cost? Can you just give them a range about how much this testing costs? And, um, you know, insurance or not insurance, they'd just like to know that. Sure. And it's such an important question. So as far as insurance goes, some psychologists are in network, some are not. Um, it really varies. It, sometimes it's difficult to find psychologists who are in network with insurance and who are able to do, build the insurance for the testing because of um, the limitations that the insurance puts on psychologists. But it, it is possible, I would encourage you to contact your insurance um, directly and find out from them a list of psychologists that are in network and then check with those individual psychologists and find out if they do testing as well. Now, keep in mind that most insurance does not cover educational tests. They, consider, they do not consider that a covered benefit. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. As far as self-pay, paying out of pocket for these evaluations, it can really range quite a bit um, depending on the extent of the testing. So if you're going in just to get a diagnostic assessment for ADHD, for example, there's going to be less testing that's necessary for that than if you're getting a full, what we call a full psychoeducational or neuropsychological evaluation, which is going to be more expensive. And it can honestly any, range anywhere from 500 to 2,000, 2,500. Um, and so it's something that you, you really, of course, need to think through and make a financial plan for that. Um, and determine if that's a way that you want to go. We also have families that will will go through the district first, and they will um, they will get the assessment through the district, see what they think about those results, and if they feel like it was thorough enough, and they agree with those results, then they'll stop there. But if not, then they may just decide to do an outside evaluation, as Allison had mentioned. Awesome. Well. Lindsay, thank you so much for sharing all that valuable information. It's it's a lot. Um, one thing, you know, I always say, so I'm a mom, I've got four kids, I have two with special needs, and, and I do this for a living. Like, I do special needs planning for a living. And what I will tell you is it's still hard, okay? So if you're ever feeling like, oh my gosh, this is so much information or overload, um, it's okay. Keep being on these webinars, keep educating yourself, keep hearing it on a regular basis and it'll start sinking in. It is a ton of information. So give yourself some grace. Um, if it's not 
all coming together, I think it's totally, totally okay. So um, I'm going to talk about how do we get started with special needs planning. Um, so we, you know, we talk about the the um, kind of the correlation of a, a special needs planner versus a financial planner. And when it comes to a special needs, it's really important that you work with a special needs planner as opposed to just an average financial planner. A special needs planner is nuanced in special needs. They understand the things that you um, can and cannot do um, to uh, and, and can essentially have as far as um, for benefits for your for your child. So many of our families don't qualify for benefits while their children are under 18. Maybe they have too much assets, but when their child turns 18, this is a big part of this this transition there. They automatically not automatically, but they oftentimes um, qualify for benefits that they didn't qualify ever before. So a lot of parents don't even know that they should apply when their child turns 18. So these are some reasons why you would work with a special needs planner so they can kind of point you in the right direction of the next steps that you should take. Um, so as you get started, gather all the necessary planning documents. What these things are, the necessary planning documents, this is the planning that you've done so far. And so here's where I say, um, I hear people say, I'd be embarrassed for you to know what we haven't done. Or they say things like that. And um, this is where we say you're here now. It's not about looking back. It's about looking forward and kind of getting a plan um, in place. So you want to gather all your necessary documents. These documents are investment statements, 401ks, 403bs, pensions, benefits through work. Um, you may have life insurance, disability, health insurance. You might even have long-term care through work. Um, and any other outside benefits that you've purchased outside of your employer. So you're going to just kind of gather this whole, your, it's like the financial house is what I would call it. Okay, so you're going to gather that all together. Then I want you to think about developing a letter of intent. So I say write this down, a, a letter of intent. A lot of people don't even know what a letter of intent is. Um, but a letter of intent, your mom, your dad, you know these things about your kids backwards and forwards you know it in your sleep you could you could whisper it in your sleep right but if something happened to you today and and you're you're incapacitated you can't speak this or you're gone this is a document this letter you could call it a family love letter you could call it a letter of intent this is everything you're a child okay who they are their date of birth their full name their social security number what their primary diagnoses are, what their medications are, a list, a name, a, a address, and phone number of all of their doctors, their specialist, um, what makes your child tick, what makes them melt down, like all of the things that you know, the favorite blanket, like all of those little things, that's what goes in this document. So if somebody else was picking this up, if your sister was picking this up and your sister was trying to fill in your shoes, um, it's gonna be hard but this is gonna like give them a really good start. So start this. Um, you don't have to do it overnight and things will pop in your head. So if you put this on your list that you're gonna do this, things will just keep popping in your head. Do this on a Word document and edit this document a couple times a year as things change um, and develop with your child, okay? So just make that on your list of, of a priority. I'm gonna get started on that. And before you know it, it just grows and grows, but this is just a, a, a true story um, of your child. And then um, I want you to really formulate a vision of how you hope things will look for your special needs child but also very importantly, how you hope things will look for you, your own future retirement, your, you and your spouse, what that looks like. Um, it's a hard job, um, uh, you know, raising special needs children. We, we have, it, it, raising kids is hard and we got teenagers, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so, and then we throw in the special needs on top of that, it, it's, def, it, it's difficult. But we eat, sleep and breathe all of this and we ourselves, we have to have a break, okay? There has to be some kind of um, care and concern for our own well-being. So when you're thinking of your vision and how you hope things will look for your kid, also think of your own well-being and your own health because you can't do it all forever um, and stay well, right? So I, I just spend some time thinking about that. Okay, so then we start looking at who will care for my child when I'm gone. I think we did have a question on that. Um, Lindsay, I'm going to have you monitor the chat box. So if there's any questions, then you can like um, bring those back, back to me. Um, so, oops. 
Okay, um, as far as uh, developing a future care plan, um, that's really what's going to answer these questions. So what we see sometimes is people are so busy living their life and doing what they do and their life is hard sometimes um, that we put on the back burner developing a future care plan. So what happens when I'm gone? What happens when I'm older? I'm, I'm, I'm no longer able um, to care for my child. What, what is that going to look like? So what I say is really um, do your homework. Consider, I just threw some out there. Okay, there's many, uh, there is many others um, that, uh, you know, as far as the, the facilities are concerned. So consider, you know, touring um, Brookwood, Marbridge Foundation, Daymark Living, um, those are some of them. And these facilities, they have, um, they have uh, Dayhab, you know, they have, um, they have residential care, partial residential care. There's a lot of different things that they have going on. And so, um, you know, spend some time touring these facilities. Some of the waiting lists for these facilities could be five years or longer. So what I'm not telling you is, oh my gosh, we're gonna push your kids right on out to residential care, okay? That's not what I'm saying. Um, but you want to have a plan, right? You want to have a plan and you want to have options um, should you need it. So your children, uh, I think, you know, when Lindsay was talking about school, our, our kids with, with special needs have the ability and right to stay in the public school to age 22. Some districts do try to push your children out. You are, you know, the advocate to decide whether or not it's in their best interest or not in their best interest to stay in the public school to age 22. But if they stay to 22 or they stay to 18, where are we going from here? That's the next thing. You know, what, what programs are available if they're not going to college? And then also what we say is just make careful consideration before um, naming siblings as a future caregiver. So um, si siblings definitely make a, um, a good successor trustee of, uh, of a special needs trust. Um, but what, when you're thinking about that, so we all, love, we all love each other, the siblings love each other and all that, all that. but just like, just like you, they have hopes and dreams too, the siblings do. We had hopes and dreams. We wanted to go to college. We wanted to have a house. We wanted to get married. We wanted to have children. Whatever it is, whatever your hopes and dreams were, we all had them and your kids have them too. And so if, if something happened to you prematurely, um, being saddled up with a special needs sibling that doesn't allow them to do the things that we did in our 20s or early 30s um, could be problematic and there could be some resentment there. So we, we just ask people to think about that and think about making siblings as trustees, successor trustees, not necessarily quote unquote 100% all the time caregivers, okay? Um, all right, so we spent a lot of time talking about funding. Um, how is my child's care gonna be funded? If my child needs care for the rest of their life, that could be pretty expensive. Um, so, you know, customarily we pay for these things um, while we're alive. We've been paying for this um, for our kids all this time, but what happens in the future? So one of the things that we, you know, like to make clear that it's really, really important to um, preserve eligibility for state and federally funded programs. So as I mentioned before, um, you know, a lot of times, a lot of families don't qualify. Their, their children do not qualify for SSI, okay, because they make too much money. So basically, the bottom line when it comes to SSI and Medicaid, um, if your child is disabled, they may qualify for SSI. But if they are under age 18 years old, um, it's based off of your income, your assets, okay? So if you're a married couple, you can have no more than $3,000 in your name, you can have one house, and you can have one car. If you are a single family, you can have $2,000 in your name, you can have one house and one car. So if you have applied for SSI and Medicaid before and you were denied and you were very frustrated because here your child sits in a wheelchair, they don't walk, they don't talk, they're clearly disabled, they have real issues and then you get denied, it's like unbelievable. But that is because SSI and Medicaid are a means-based tested system, okay? So the magic age is 18. So when you turn, when the child turns 18, even if the child still lives with you, uh, that child, it will be based off of the child's assets, okay? So still they can have one car, one house, and they can have $2,000, up to $2,000 in their assets 
and in assets for all sources. So even if you've been denied before, once your top child turns 18, you do um, want to reapply for SSI and Medicaid. And um, you can do it the month that they turn 18. And I recommend calling Social Security about three months in advance to schedule that appointment, okay? Um, so another way that we can fund um, care is establishing a special needs trust for their future care. So how do we have all this money for this child if the child qualifies for SSI? And this is, you know, having a special needs trust, okay? So um, a special needs trust, there is a first party and a third party special needs trust, but basically there can be unlimited assets in the special needs trust to provide for the care for your for your child for the future. So that will not disqualify a person for qualifying for SSI in the future. Okay, so that's one one place. Um, we also have um, things like life insurance and other assets that fund a trust. So yes, you can be independently wealthy, you can be a millionaire, and you can fund your special needs trust with all of your millions of dollars. But most people. Um, are probably going to spend 25 to 35 years in retirement. And if they do that, they're probably going to need their retirement assets in retirement. Okay. So a lot of people fund the future care for their child um, in a special needs trust through life insurance upon their death that would be funded into the special needs trust. Um, and then the, the next place is an ABLE account. So that, um, through the tax code 529A for ABLE, um, an ABLE account is another allowable asset that a, that a family can have, that the, the special needs child can have. They can put $15,000 a year into it and, um, and no more than a total of $100,000 for the total account value. So having money in these blocks or buckets, if you will, um, will not um, cause you to disqualify or or, or be ineligible for, for social benefits. Um, and on here, I have Social Security Disability and Medicare. And I just wanna just, um, I just wanna take a moment and say, there's so many people that are so confused between SSI and Social Security Disability. So when somebody says Social Security, they're talking about Social Security dis Disability, which is also called SSDI. SSI is means-based. SSDI or Social Security is based off of working quarters. So sometimes I have people that call me and they're very, very upset because they applied. When you apply, you actually apply for both and they know that your child's going to get denied for SSDI because they don't have 40 quarters. They don't have the working quarters, right, to qualify for SSDI. So the first letter you get in the mail is from Social Security saying that you've been denied and people are mortified. They can't believe it. Their child is so disabled and they're denied. But that is just a form letter and it comes first and it and they are denied for Social Security disability. But the SSI letter comes second. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, dealing with Social Security, um, it's, it's fun. It's like the college board. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, what I will tell you is um, be smart. Uh, start your Word document um, of your commu communications with Social Security and keep that running document. When you call them, when did you call them? Who did you talk to? What did they say? What did you say? What were they going to do? What were you going to do? Document everything. If you send something, you send it certified. Keep the tracking number. Uh, they lose things. It, it, it's a process and you can expect that um, there are like about 200 disabilities that are kind of presumptive that they will be kind of automatically qualify like Down syndrome is one of them. There's a whole list out there. Um, there is a there, there's a, a there's a long list, but you can expect once you apply for SSI and, and Medicaid that it could take anywhere from three to six months. It's not a fast process. So I just want to set the expectations um, right for that. So how do I protect my child's government benefits? So making sure that you have your assets and your child's assets in the appropriate buckets. It's not that you can't have a, an account in your child's name. It is that you can't have an account in your child's name that has any more than $2,000 in it unless it's in an ABLE account or a special needs trust. So the magic number is $2,000. So that's that. And then um, this is really, really important is ensuring that your special needs family member, um, their name is not set up as a beneficiary. And anytime we're on a call like this, um, I, I bet you like over half of the people on the call um, have their spouse or a really close family member as the beneficiary and then they have their kids 
um, their minor children set up as beneficiaries as contingent. Like if my spouse is dead and gone, then my kids are going to get the money. It's easy. I want my kids to get the money. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a bad idea for a number of reasons, whether you have special needs kids or not. Um, if your children are minors, it's a bad idea um, because um, if you die, then that money is going to sit in trust for them until they turn 18. And when they turn 18, they're going to get all of the money, which is a horrible idea. So, um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, is if you leave um, money specifically to the name special needs child, as opposed to a special needs trust, uh, they're automatically going to disqualify for SSI and Medicaid because they're going to have more than $2,000. Uh, in their name and you cannot disinherit. You can't say, I'm not gonna take the money. It's not like that. So um, the other thing is make sure grandma and grandpa haven't left money uh, to, uh, left money specifically to your special needs um, child. Um, grandma and grandpa sometimes are secretive about things. Um, they're kind of secretive about their finances and stuff. One of the ways that you can talk to them or talk to your parents about this is, hey, we're doing some financial planning and we learned that we cannot leave money directly to little Johnny um, because if we do, it will make him disqualify or never qualify for benefits in the future. So I don't know if you've done anything. I'm not assuming anything. However, it is important that it's left to a special needs trust. So having those conversations and we can kind of help with that, but this is a big, big no-no and it's a big mistake that we see um, absolutely every week. Okay, Lindsay, I see we have some questions. Do you want to come to me? Sure. Yes, I think someone also chimed in and answered, but just to clarify, um, is $2,000 the balance or monthly? $2,000 total assets is what you can have, right? So as long as your account doesn't go over $2,000, right, it's not necessarily about what you're making specifically. It's about, it's, it's, there is a such thing as substantial gainful employment. So if the, if the, the child is disabled, but they're working and they're, they're making quite a bit of money, then that's considered substantial gainful employment, then maybe they don't qualify for SSI anymore. But the magic number is definitely 2,000 if you're single. Um, all sources, all accounts, and you can't hide it. There's a look back period. They're going to look at these things. They find it. They know. Um, and three thousand dollars if you're married for a married couple. Okay. And then um, to clarify the age, they need to wait until they have turned eighteen, and then you apply. Is that right? So Basically, uh, for for the bulk of the clients that we serve, um, they their their client their their kids don't qualify. Um, if your assets are lower than um, two thousand or lower than three thousand for a married couple, and you have one car and you have one house, okay. So if you have two cars, you are you don't qualify. If you have more than one house, if you have a the house you live in and a rental house, you don't qualify. So if if your assets are less than that then um, then you could apply prior to the child turning um, turning 18. But if they're more than that, you'll, you will be denied. So, but the, the key thing to know is that 18 changes everything. So I've heard families say um, that I, um, well, we didn't apply because we didn't know we got denied before. Why would we do this again? Why would we keep doing the same thing over again? It, it's just, it, it's kind of like this magic age, this transition, like we're talking about, this 18 changes everything. It's based off of their assets and not, not yours at that time. So that's where um, that's where it comes into play. Okay, that's all for now, go ahead. Okay, perfect. All right, when do I need a special needs trust and guardianship? So as we talked about, a special needs trust will preserve benefit eligibility while providing resources for the special needs child. Um, so if you have a child that is special needs that will likely need some sort of care for the rest of their life, some sort of assistance or something, uh, you think that your child is going to, you, you plan to apply for, if you, if you never plan to apply for SSI, okay, so it's possible that maybe you don't need a special needs trust because it doesn't matter, right? Um, but if you think your child is going to need care in the future, then you should probably have a special needs trust and it can be dissolved in the future if you need to. Um, we did a presentation today on guardianship and supported decision making. Um, so there are different types and different levels of guardianship uh, that you can apply for, which if you're applying for, for a full guardianship, then you have to prove to the state that that needs to happen. So um, I don't remember if this was um, on this caller. I think we had somebody say, what if the kid is against this or whatever? You know, we have crabby teenagers, right? Like it's a fact, right? Like they don't always like our ideas right now, right? Um, so the, the guardianship, 
a, a lot of our kids, if they're ASD or they're ADHD and their brains are maturing three to five years um, slower than uh, their peers, um, there may be a need for guardianship or supported decision making at um, age 18. Um, some of um, some of us others, like I, I don't have guardianship or supported decision making. I have a POA and healthcare POA, which is perfectly fine for my my unique situation with with my adult daughter. Um, but you can apply for this um, six months prior to the, um, the the child turning 18, and it is a process, and it does go through the courts, and it's not forever. So you can't. It might be forever, um, but it might be for a time being. So you might have supported decision making for a time being. Um, maybe you have guardianship for a while, and then you move to supported decision making. Um, but these are things that you should start that process. I recognize that there's probably people on um, on this that um, maybe missed the boat on a. 18. Um, even if you have kids that aren't special needs, I do recommend power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney because even if they go off to college, if something happens and there's an accident and you don't have that and they're in the hospital, literally the hospital doesn't have to tell you anything. They're an adult and you don't have the documents. So I do actually recommend that for, for our kids that are, are, are not special needs. Um, and then uh, really, I really, just like I talk about a special needs planner versus a, a, a traditional financial planner, I really recommend, and we do, um, you know, we do make referrals mm -hmm. um, for qualified attorneys, but having a qualified attorney prepare these documents and um, all attorneys aren't created equally. They don't all do the same things. And many of them are not nuanced and special needs and they can accidentally mess you up. OK, so like we attend um, a UT law conference every year that talks about how these trusts need to set, be set up. Um, so how they don't um, they they don't disqualify, you know, you don't become disqualified for SSI. And um, really, the attorneys that are a part of this, those are the attorneys that need to um, to draft your documents, to draft your guardianship, to draft um, to draft your wills and, and your special needs trust. So it's not all created equally. I know people, some people have a free legal service. They never have a special needs planning attorney, just so you know. <laughs> um, Every once in a while, you might, if you work for you know a, a university or something like that, you might find one. But um, we can definitely make some recommendations. But I cannot tell you that enough. Um, I have really seen some real train wrecks of of documents where people paid thousands of dollars for these documents, um, and they were wrong. I mean, they were wrong, and 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 they failed to qualify as a special needs trust in the eyes of Social Security. So that's why it matters so much. This is where um, you really don't want to cut corners. So I see we have some more questions. Do you want to read those to me? Um, sure, we do. Okay, if Social Security money is not moved from the designated beneficiary account, does the $2,000 limit apply? Can you read that to me again? I'm not sure I understand. Sure. If, sorry, if Social Security money is not moved from the designated beneficiary account, does the $2,000 limit apply? So if it's not moved, anytime it goes over $2,000, I'm not sure I totally understand the question you can clarify, but anytime if the account goes over $2,000, then it does, it does count, okay? It does count against you. Um, but like, what about spending down? Okay, so there's no such thing as hiding. We don't hide money from Social Security, okay? They find it, you don't do that. Um, but there are things that you can spend money on. So if you know that you're kind of coming around the bend for age 18 for your child and you got more than $2,000 in their name, well, number one, if you have a 529C, a college plan, we can convert that $15,000 a year into an ABLE account. So that's one thing that can happen. Another thing that can happen is you can spend the money on the well-being of the child. Maybe they need a car. Maybe they need a new iPhone. Maybe they need a new laptop for their online learning experience. Um, all of those types of things, you can spend that money on just have proof, right? So, um, you know, have proof on what, what you've spent. It. I'm not sure I answered that question, um, but like just simply moving the money, like if the child is a lot younger and you want to just close any bank account that's in the kid's name, I'm I'm a fan of um, of not necessarily having accounts in the kid's name when they're younger anyway, because when you go to apply for your for your non special needs um, kids or college bound kids, when you go and you look at FAFSA, you know they're looking at um, the money in your kid's names is counted way more against you on the FAFSA application than it is anywhere else. So that's a whole nother can of worms. But um, 
But so, you know, if your kids are younger and you want to close a savings account, you can open it up and, you know, um, in your own name, if you want to do that. And, you know, you have it in your own name and your kid isn't listed if they're younger. But if you're right there at the threshold of 18 and it's already a day late and a dollar short, you got too much money in the account, consider spending it down on things for, for the benefit of the child. And, um, and if they're, you know, 15 or 16, you know, get to moving that where it needs to be in a, in a position like, transferring it from a college plan to an ABLE account, those types of things are things that we can consider. All right, we got some more questions. Yeah, um, there's a couple questions about costs. So how much does it cost to set up a special needs trust and how much does it cost to get a POA? Okay, so um, we actually, we have um, several attorneys that we work with and that we refer that we know are honest and good and they actually have special needs children themselves that have transitioned. Um, they're honest and good because they provide us their price sheets, right? So it depends on what you're needing. It depends if you're married, if you're single. It depends if, you know, you're getting a special needs trust versus a testamentary special needs trust. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of all across the board. Um, but I would use, and, and, and you kind of said this about testing, but I would use the same, um, the same uh, range of as low as 500 and as much as 2,500 if we're getting into more complicated um, complicated cases. But um, we can definitely make a referral and, and provide those um, price sheets. We like to work with attorneys that their fees are um, clear. We know what they are. It's not a sliding scale. The more you make, the more we charge you. And um, so, um, so we definitely do have that. Um, any additional questions? There are a few others. Did you wanna go ahead and move forward or do you wanna and wait uh, for the end or you wanna take these now? I think we're over time, so I, I'll kind of rush through these slides and we're, we're, we're close. Um, so there's a lot of confusion and questions about ABLE accounts. Um, so an ABLE account, again, is under a five, the 529A tax code, um, and it's for disabled individuals whose disability started before age 26, okay? So the disability had to start um, prior to age 26. Um, the contributions can be made by anybody. You can have 15,000, you can put $15,000 a year and it's one account, one ABLE account per disabled individual. Um, distributions for qualified disability expenses are not taxable and earnings on distributions for non-qualified expenses are subject to ordinary income tax. So basically if, he, if what you can use an ABLE account for is very broad, but if you use it for other things, then you could be penalized, right? Um, Tax-free growth and in, uh, investments that can be changed by the participant twice a year. And it could be rolled to other family members who are eligible beneficiaries. Now, one of the key things to know is that states may be able to claim reimbursement for expenses paid by Medicaid, okay? So any additional funds um, to be distributed to, de um, to designated beneficiaries are rolled over to eligible family members. So if your child is getting SSI and Medicaid, what this means, if, if somebody says, well, there's a drawback or there's a clawback, or there's a Medicaid payback. So those are some of the terms that people use. Um, that's basically saying that if your child passes away, um, that they could um, draw some of this, this money back. Okay, but here's the deal. Um, the average care for, um, for future care on a very minimal basis is probably 1.2 to 1.5 million if we were um, talking about 30 years of care for special, for, for special needs. Um, the ABLE account can only hold $100,000. So um, that's the max that it can hold. A lot of people ask me, why should I have an ABLE account and a special needs trust? And um, basically the reason for, for that is that um, you can pay for rent and mortgage payments and food and shelter out of an ABLE account and you can't out of a, a special needs trust. So you could buy a house straight up out of a, a special needs trust, but debt service, um, you know, your, your, your regular utilities, your mortgage and rent and that kind of thing um, is supposed to be covered by SSI and or you can pay for it out of the ABLE account. So that is why you might need both. Okay, so here is a list of the things that an ABLE account can pay for. Um, and it's an, ex it's an exhaustive list. There's a lot of stuff that kind of falls under this category. But um, as you can see, um, education and training also can be paid for out of an ABLE account. So again, if you have the 529C um, for your your child, um, it can be converted to an ABLE account and there can be a lot of other things paid for out of the ABLE account that a 529C can't pay for. Um, 
So, and then over here, this is a long list. Uh, everybody has to look close at this one. It's a little bit smaller, but these are the items um, that a special needs trust uh, can pay for. So um, what you see in the bottom right hand corner is buying a house or real property, but what you don't see um, is, is like, again, the rent or the mortgage payments, which is, is a big payment. We all know that that's a big part of our monthly bill service, right? So whether they're, um, whether they're in an apartment at college or in a dorm or those types of things, that's why you might not, might need both. Um, okay, I think, yeah, that's it. So um, we've wrapped up our slides. I think we have a, a few other questions. Do you wanna um, go through, th through some of those, Lindsay? Sure. Um, okay, let me back up here. Uh, let's see, can you have a bank account with less than 2000 and ABLE account at the same time when the child is older than 18 years old? Yes. Um, so like uh, in the example for my adult daughter, she has a checking account. I'm like on it with her, right? So she has her own checking account. She has an ABLE account and she has a special needs trust. So yes, you absolutely can. You can't have more than $2,000 in any other buckets other than the ABLE account and the special needs trust. We can have $15,000 a year in the ABLE account up to a total of 100,000. It can't be more than 100,000. You can have an unlimited amount of money in a special needs trust, but no more than $2,000 of all other sources. And um, newsflash, sometimes grandparents like to buy savings bonds, right? Okay, and sometimes they did that 15 years ago and we forgot about them. Those could be used against you. So you might wanna consider cashing those in. You might wanna think about any like things that you forgot about that are out there because I promise you they will find them. <laughs> so um, yeah, for sure. So you can have all three. Next. Okay, and then we have a question about what children, what kids should have a guardianship versus a power of attorney. So, um, so a guardianship is a child that um, is that simply cannot make decisions for themselves. They might be completely incapacitated. They might not walk. They might not talk. Uh, they could uh, have the the IQ of seventy or below. Those are some examples um, of where uh, the guardianship needs to take place. An example of supported decision making might be for a high functioning autistic child or someone that is ADHD that isn't quite there yet at 18, we're still hope, hopeful and optimistic that they're going to get there. That, so that could be supported decision-making. And when you've got a child that um, maybe they have a disability, maybe they have a physical disability, okay? So maybe, um, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe just, just, a, just a physical disability, but not an intellectual disability. Um, and so that's maybe where the power of attorney, um, the power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney, um, these kids are of sound mind, but their body might not be that sound. Um, so that's where um, you kind of would go, um, go down the path of the healthcare power of attorney and power of attorney. And, and again, a qualified attorney can, um, they, they really spend a lot of time of explaining the differences to you and helping, and, and helping you understand if you're going down the guardianship path, what you have to prove to the courts. Um, your child is going to get a guardian ad litem, okay? So your child, the oppositional child that doesn't want this, is going to tell the guardian ad litem that they don't want it and tell all the reasons why. Um, the court is still going to make the decision, but they do have like this impartial thing. The attorney will meet with the child because they don't, you know, they want to avoid the 18 year old child looking at the parent, you know, waiting for this. What do you think? You know, you know, what do you think about that? How should I answer that mom? Um, and so, you know, the courts ultimately will make the decision, but the attorney will help you um, tee that up. Okay. Um, we have a couple other questions. Um, can you pay for housing out of special needs trust if you choose to not take any government benefits? You can pay for a house. Well, if you're not taking any government benefits, do you necessarily need a special needs trust? Maybe mm -hmm. you just need a trust. Maybe it doesn't have to be a special needs trust. Like, so I, mean, I, I think you could kind of go, go back and forth on that. Um, a special needs trust can buy a, buy a house outright, right? They just can't pay pay the debt service. But it, if you're not getting benefits or you don't plan on getting benefits in the future, then you know then then that lends itself of to need a special needs trust or not to need a special needs trust. Um, 
but I, I think, you know, the future path and kind of, you know, again, some, some of us on this call know for sure that our children are going to need care for the rest of their life. Some of us um, are not sure, but we're still hopeful, you know? So I, I think that everybody's kind of, uh, you know, the jury's out, but if you have a special needs trust and it needs to be dissolved later, your child doesn't need benefits, the, they, they emerged, they were slower to emerge, like you were talking about early, earlier, Lindsay, um, it can be dissolved. Okay. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll just do one more and then everyone can, can go ahead and email additional questions after this. We're about 20 minutes over. Um, there's also a question about, are there any options as far as funding for disability related training? Options for disability related training. So there are um, like um, through, through TWC and there are a lot of interest lists out there, um, um, HCS, um, Texas Home Living and CLASS are some of the interest lists out there. So if you haven't heard of that before, Texana and Fort Bend, um, Harris County, somebody can put that in, in the chat box for Harris County. But there are interest lists that you should put yourself on. The, the waiting list is very, very long. It's ridiculously long, like 12 or 15 years. I don't even know. We've been on the list since 2011 and we're nowhere close. So, um, but if, if you're not on the list, you want to put yourself on the list. Um, there, so there are training, um, training programs um, uh, through those services once you qualify for those services. But again, that may be something that the Greater Houston Disability Chamber, because they are all about getting disabled people to work and they do have a lot of workshops and, and trainings and things like that. I, I um, there are a lot of resources out there, and if any um, families have some and you want to put them uh, in the chat box, you certainly can. But I would definitely reach out to the Greater Houston uh, Disability Chamber on that. Okay. Do you want me to give you one more, or you want to stop there? I'll take one more, and then we'll um, close it out. And um, you know, um, we will we will definitely send out the slides and the recording of this. Um, we really try. Um, we really try to take our time and answer questions. Uh, we know that this is confusing, so we'll take one more, and then we'll close it out. And you guys can look for an email tomorrow um, with the recording and the slides. Okay, so last question. What about a special needs trust paying for monthly fees for a Brookwood type experience? So that should be able to be covered um, through the, the special needs trust. That should be able to be covered, yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, Lindsay, I would, you know, just like to thank you. Um, you know, Lindsay and I, um, both moms of, of, of kids that, uh, with, with special needs, we came together, I don't know, it was probably four or five years ago, we were at the same conference and we came together and we decided that we were going to launch the um, ADHD support group of Fort Bend um, for parents and kids and teens. And so, um, so uh, Lindsay and I have um, kind of known each other for a while now and um, I'm definitely better for, for knowing Lindsay and I know um, a lot of our families um, have um, you know, interacted with your practice. So we're thankful for that. It's hard to find um, good counseling services, um, good services. They're, that's not all created equal either. So um, I'm, I'm glad that you were with us tonight and shared such valuable information. We like, um, we would just like to thank all of you for being here tonight, um, taking your time um, out of your evening. And we will have more um, more presentations where we're all about education. I'm all about advocacy. I want to put the tools in your hand so you know what to do. You've got the, you know, you've got the right questions to ask and you know the right path to go down. But like I said, give yourself some grace. So whether you're really far down the line and you're planning, um, whether you're just starting, this is, you know, kind of the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, you're here tonight, so I'm glad you're here and, um, and, and good, luck, good luck as you get started um, on your path. So thanks so much for being here. Bye. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night.